Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2015 Napa Valley Harvest Press Conference. I'm Jennifer Putnam, the Executive Director for the Napa Valley Grape Growers. We represent 700 vineyard owners and associated businesses here in Napa County. And we have three experts with us today to discuss the conditions of this vintage year and also some, uh, some looks forward at what we can expect out of the wines. Um, with us is Matt Reed. Matt is the winemaker at Benissari Vineyards and Estate Winery. PJ Alviso is the director of Estate Viticulture with Duckhorn Wine Company. And Remy Cohen is vice president and general manager of Lady Family Wines, where we are today in this beautiful location in Yauntville. Remy's also on the board of directors for the Napa Valley Grape Growers. And of course, PJ, Matt Reed, Duckhorn, and Benissari, both members of the organization. Um, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So why don't we start with a description and some discussion about the growing season this year. It's been unusual, um, although there's one grower in Napa Valley who I love. He, he says this year's different, just like last year. <laughs> um, so, but this year we had some early bud break, early bloom, and, and so talk to us through, most people think of harvest as really the only critical time, but as we know, the growing season, the critical times begin early on with pruning, and then once the emergence of the plant material uh, shows up then we've got a lot of concerns in the springtime so maybe if you can go back to spring and talk briefly about what we saw then and how that shaped up harvest. Matt? Yeah well bud break started very early um, about three weeks ahead of normal and uh, despite some cooler weather that followed in in May um, the vines never really slowed down um, so we kept an, uh, a fast pace and um, it kept all the viticulture people scrambling to keep up <laughs> with what the vines are doing. Um, can elaborate yeah, it was for us just a total. It was a roller coaster. It was it was early and it was warm early, and then it cooled down, and then it got super hot. Um, I mean, in some of our vineyards, the warmest season on record. Uh, just because, and, it, and that means a lot because it was making up for a cooler May. Um, so then that kind of brought on the early harvest for us. Yeah, it was interesting. It started out really early. We had a very dry and warm winter. Um, we did have some well-timed rains in December and February, but after that it was warm and dry and so bud break started early, but then we actually um, had really cool weather mid-May through June, so we were actually tracking um, thermal time accumulation behind 2012, 2013, and 2014 until July, and basically once July hit, we really started to see some hotter weather and hot days, and for us it was uh, one of the warmest seasons on record. And so talk to us a little bit about how that, those spring conditions, uh, how they contributed to the development of the grape clusters. The vines were confused uh, for a little while. Uh, I mean, just like all plants were watching like tomatoes in my garden. Uh, it just, they, they thought it was time to grow. They thought it was, you know, late spring, early summer temperature wise. So they started to grow and then it cooled down in May and it kind of um, hormone wise kind of threw them through a loop. Uh, so we saw some, we saw some shatter. We saw some uneven ripening, uh, I think were the two main themes for us in the vineyards um, and, and to different degrees, depending on where the vineyards were and, and varietally dependent. And PJ, you have vineyards in various locations. W w talk to us briefly about the variability. Yeah, I think the variability for me, it wasn't it wasn't Appalachian specific. It wasn't varietal specific. It was like pretty much directly related to when we pruned or when we went through bud break. Um, and so there was blocks that were way ahead um, that actually went through that flowered and set before it cooled down in May. Uh, those kind of went in one group. There was another group that was uh, flowering right when it cooled down. Those definitely were affected the most. And then there was a later group like Howe Mountain. Uh, that probably was the one Appalachian definitely was different. Um, that was so far behind it didn't really get affected by the cool down in May. And how does all of this affect yields, which is, of course, on uh, front of mind for growers in Napa Valley? Well, yields were down. Uh, and, and people, we, in discussions with other growers and everything, what we're finding is if you actually look at the records, yields are closer to a multi-year average. But um, after getting spoiled the last three years with large vintages, it really feels like um, Mother Nature shorted us this year on the grapes. And we wish we had more because the, the quality that we're seeing is just fantastic. So yields were off from the last three years, but were they off normal? For us, we were seeing our yields down maybe 10 to 15, maybe 20% from average, but because 2012, 2013, and 2014 were more abundant vintages, it seemed more dramatic yield reduction, uh, maybe about 30 to 40% if you just took the last three-year average. 
And then taking that fruit all the way up to, to today, which, you know, most people are announcing the end of harvest this week, next week, uh, which is really exciting. At earliest ever? For us, yeah. Yeah, Same. earliest in, on record. Yeah. yeah. Earliest harvest on record. Um, and so the quality of that fruit and the condition of that fruit that you're bringing in, you're, Matt, you're a winemaker. Yeah, at Benestri Remy? Vineyards, we couldn't be happier with, with what we brought in. Um, just really great stuff. Again, my only complaint is that there's too little of it. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh, yeah, we're seeing we're seeing high quality across the board. Um, I think it's something interesting thing to keep in mind is is to us it feels it's the first of, of October this week, right, on our calendar. But to the vines, when they started the season, the amount of temperature they got, it's the end of October, like on a on a calendar basis for how those temperatures would normally track. So it's early again, like on a, on a Julian calendar. But in terms of actual ripening and how long the plants got to ripen, it's a normal season. We're seeing really nice concentration in our wines and also nice freshness from a lot of bright, vibrant acidity. And I think that that's going to make the 2015 wines really ageable. And what, what, what's the last variety that you're all bringing in? Well, we have finished harvesting almost everything um, on September 21st, except we have about a ton and a half of Petit Verdot <laughs> coming in from Thorovilos Vineyard, which is at the base of Howl Mountain. Um, that's coming in tomorrow, so we'll officially be done tomorrow. And then what's next after all the fruit is brought in? Sleepy time. <laughs> For you. Yeah. That's when Matt and the winemakers get really busy. Yeah, yeah we're, we're still busy. We're uh, you know nursing the fermentations along. Um, we find, uh, again, even though it's an early harvest, as PJ was saying, the, the grapes had the full growing season. They had this, the full amount of time and the full amount of heat. And that heat really helped uh, with tannin maturation. And so we've got um, really beautiful structure in the wines, and it's, it's a matter of, of delicate handling in the winery now to, to make sure that the wines live up to the potential of the grapes. Yeah, I joke about sleepy time, but these guys have three, four more weeks of, of pressing out and then barreling down and taking it from there. So, uh, and in the vineyards, I think you guys doing the same thing, uh, erosion control, cover crop seeding, um, composting, all that kind of stuff, kind of getting the, the vines ready for winter. And when will we get a first glimpse, first taste? Uh, so come by the winery anytime. <laughs> um, no, um, I mean, we started so early, uh, we brought in our first reds on August 26th. So those wines are already in barrel, already through malolactic fermentation. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. So uh, it, you know, it takes them a while to show their true colors, but um, you know, we can taste them now and, and have a good idea of what they're going to be like. And what can you tell about the characteristic of this vintage um, so far? You know, Remy already touched on it. We've got a beautiful acidity to match the, the uh, bright fruit flavors. And, uh, and as, as I was saying, the, uh, the tannin uh, quality is really fine. Um, so we've got uh, wines that will be well, red wines that will be well structured, um, but uh, not at all overpowering, just very um, elegant. Let's switch gears a little bit. Uh, f front of mind for everyone in California is uh, water availability, of course, with our fourth year of drought. Um, I want to talk about scarcity of water, and then I want to talk about abundance of water with the predicted El Nino ahead. Um, so if you can briefly just touch on some of the water conservation best practices that you've been employing, uh, given, given our situation in California. Well, one thing that was fortunate about the 2015 vintage, even though we didn't have a lot of rain, we had rain at good times. So we had um, about 15 inches here on Cliff Lady Vineyards in December, which helped to replenish the groundwater and um, our reservoirs. And then we also had about five or six inches of rain in mid-February, and that helped to set the stage for growing the canopies as bud break was occurring and the season was just getting started. Um, so the well-timed rains were really critical in allowing the vines to develop healthy canopies. And um, after that, really, we have to be conservative with our water. So our viticulturist, Allison Cellini, monitors um, the, the weather through our weather station. We also have Fruition Sciences, which is a new technology that measures sap flow, actual vine water use, and we can see how the vines are responding to environmental demand and only irrigate when it's necessary. And we can actually watch and see how long the irrigation lasts and how much to put on based on the duration of the irrigation and the demand in the vines. Long term, will you, are, you, are any of you looking at different strategies when you uh, do a replant? Or are, there, you know, are you looking at site specifications or varietal distinctions things yeah, like that? Yeah, I think we have to be conscientious about those decisions, the water situation, 
I don't think anybody's predicting that we're going to have as much water as we want in the future. It's only going to get more restrictive. So, uh, yeah, I mean, making the right decisions, putting in drought tolerant root stocks, um, putting in fine spacing that um, that makes sure we're not having to water more than we have to, uh, putting the right varietals in the right places so you're not extending seasons longer than you have to and irrigating late season, um, putting in cover crops uh, that um, that don't compete with the vines, stuff like that, or and out compete weeds that use water, stuff like that. I think you have to you have to use all the tools in our toolboxes now, and and especially the monitoring tools that, that Remy's talking about. Um, I think we can. I'm really surprised we use fruition science as well with the sap flow and looking at how the vines are reacting. And it's our inclination to, to want to put water on, to want to reduce the stress in these vines because they may look a little tired on a hot day, but when you really dive into it and look at how much water the vines have, a lot of times we don't need to water. So being able to to skip an irrigation is huge. Um, and especially we talk about, you know, across the number of vines and acres that we manage. And one of the things that's always differentiated Napa Valley from other wine growing regions is our adoption of innovative practices, technology, uh, you know, putting research to work. And, and so talk to us a little bit more about some of the, the set flow monitors clearly help, but talk to us briefly about some of the other innovations that have come into your practices in the last two years. Weather stations, drones, yeah. you know, any yeah. of those. I mean, drones are really <laughs> interesting. I mean, it's a toy, but it's a tool. Yeah, I think drones and kind of that whole concept of aerial imaging we use a lot. Um, so taking um, basically photos above the vineyard and looking at uh, on an infrared spectrum so we can see weak areas and strong areas, and then we can tailor our irrigation to that. So instead of irrigating, say, a 10-acre block, we can find the weakest three acres, uh, which maybe has more stress, and, and put the water there so we're conserving water that way. Um, weather stations, we have weather stations at all of our vineyards, and I would guess everybody here does. Um, so we can see, you know, you know, I think one of the great things about Napa is a day in Carneros and a day in Calistoga are not the same day. Um, so instead of, you know, panicking and saying, okay, put water on the vineyards, um, you know, we can see how much stress there actually is, what the climactic demand is for each vineyard or even each block where we have weather stations and then really tailoring our, our irrigations that way. That's good. So the National o Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration is predicting 95% chance that we've got an El Nino year ahead. What does that mean? What, what does a wet winter spring mean for the three of you and for growers across the valley? Well, I think everybody is hopeful that we will have an abundant rain season this year. Um, Scientists are predicting that it should help a lot with replenishment, but not necessarily relieve the California drought. Um, but it all helps at this point. So as PJ mentioned earlier, we're getting our vineyards prepared with the proper erosion control and cover crops to set the stage for what will hopefully be a rainy winter. And it, those predictions I've read have also talked about how it's going to be a warm, um, rainy winter. And that um, that's unfortunate in terms of the Sierra Nevada snowpack. But um, for us, it means that if we have late spring rains, they'll, they'll, the temperatures will stay up and frost um, damage will be much less of a concern. And that'll also help us conserve a little more water if we, um, since uh, many vineyards use um, overhead sprayers to protect against frost. I think an important distinction too, and one thing we've talked about a lot this year is, uh, is Napa Valley specifically being hydro hydrologically disconnected from the rest of California. Um, so. There's a drought in it, and California is in a serious state. But in Napa, I mean, we received you know almost 75 or 80 percent of rainfall, depending on of normal rainfall, depending on where you were. The the water table is holding up. Um, I mean, it's not. It's it has held up. Uh, we're not seeing any drop in the water table at all. So we're while there is a drought and there there has put stress on the vines. It's not it's not serious as it is in, in other parts of the state. So um, bring on all the rain that there is, I'll, I'll take it. But uh, <laughs> but we're, we're not in as bad a shape as other parts of California. So now we're gonna switch to some questions off Twitter. Um, we talked about the growing season, we talked about fire, drought, rain we had, we didn't talk about it, but we did have some rain yesterday. Um, there, El Nino, we've got a lot of important issues in front of us. How does that, how does that shape the future of the Napa Valley wine grape market and what does that mean to consumers when it comes down to wine bottle pricing. The 2014 harvest, the value for Napa County wine grapes was $706 million, which was an all-time record. Um, a ton of Cabernet, the Napa Valley average is you know almost $6,000. Talk to us a little bit about how that extends out to consumers and people that might be watching this not in the industry. Well. I think consumers are in a good spot because 2012, 2013, 2014 are all great vintages with good quali quali quality but also good quantity, nice abundance. Um, so this is the time to start collecting wine and um, 
I think because of that, California, the wine market has um, a little bit of excess supply, but demand for Napa is really um, maintaining very strong and it's on the rise and it's continuing to rise. Um, so having a lighter vintage in 2015, um, we might be looking at, um, you know, going into a little bit of a um, demand situation for Napa Valley wines. And I know the, the grape demand was very high. Um, I, I've heard stories of people uh, calling around at the last minute looking for a little more Cabernet Sauvignon and just getting laughter on the other end of the telephone. <laughs> um, it, uh, they're just, you know, the grapes weren't out there this year. And if, if you were waiting for the last minute to buy on the spot market, wasn't you couldn't. <laughs> yeah, I totally, totally echo the thoughts. I think 12, 13, 14, we were kind of saying if you couldn't, if you couldn't make good wine in those vintages, you probably shouldn't be making wine. Uh, so I think that that's great for the consumer to be able to, to have that confidence in any wine they're buying. Um, and then, yeah, 15, I think while we were a little below average, it's not like there's a shortage. Uh, it was, it was a little shorter than we would have liked, but it's not like none of us were able to make wine this year because there weren't the grapes. We were, there'll definitely be product out there. Last topic that we want to cover, and this is coming from the Twitter feed also, the uh, labor situation. Um, talk to us about shortages, um, maybe just a brief explanation of your workforce and how you manage that situation. Um, are, they, are they, you know, are they long term, are they short term, are they seasonal, uh, you know, Wages, the Napa Valley Grape Growers, I can add a little bit of color to this, that we have a wages and benefits survey that we produce every year. And this year uh, showed that the average for us is $14 an hour for a field worker, for entry level field work. Um, and some of the other highlights from that survey is 52% farm workers have a 401k program. Um, more than 50% of our growers pay educational assistance, disability insurance, sick leave, things like that, benefits of that nature. So we, we track wages, but we also track benefits. Um, so we feel, you know, that there are, that there's a, a good future for everyone here and that it's a, um, and we have a farm worker foundation to ensure that they're getting the professional development they need. At the same time, California has labor issues and uh, we, we need to be cognizant of those issues, how do you differentiate your operation from that broader California labor discussion? Small question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think you uh, start with one trend and then just talk a little bit about duck corn. Um, you've seen an interesting trend. I, I grew up on vineyards and you saw then it really was a migrant workforce. You'd have guys come in, um, weren't there for the whole season, get through harvest, and then they, they'd go home. Um, we see now a lot more um, getting guys we're getting employees and they're sticking around a lot longer um, you know we have a pretty tenured workforce now most of these guys have been here six seven years um, so I think that then gives us opportunity um, when they want to they want to learn more they want to be better employees without that shorter time frame um, and then also gives us opportunity to invest in them so uh, I think we've seen some really great great outreach through the grape growers through the farm workers um, and at Duckhorn where you know the quality of what these guys do, it's not field work. I mean, these guys are artists with grapevines in terms of, of pruning and canopy management and harvesting. I mean, they do all those things better and quicker than any of us can. Uh, so we, we want to invest in them. I mean, it's cool. I'm really proud to say at Duckhorn, the, the field workers have the same benefits package as the president, uh, which is, is awesome. And I think that's the trend you're seeing in Napa, um, is that, that none of us are here, none of us is here without those guys in the field. So investing in them is the best thing we can do. Uh, and, the, and the one thing we can do, um, the biggest thing, I think, in terms of sustainability for this, this entire uh, valley. And you say guys, but uh, isn't it true that more women have entered that vineyard workforce in Absolutely. the last five years? Yeah, 100%. Do you have any percentages of your workforce that you can... I don't off the top of my head, but I think yeah. you're, you're, uh, I mean, it's, there's no, um, I, don't, I would guess the percentage. I've heard 20 to 30% yeah. in the vineyard management companies, yeah. which is, which, um, any other comments on, on, on um, at Cliff Lady Vineyards, we also have a full-time crew that works year round and they're fully benefited, also have the same benefits package as the rest of the company. And we really look, um, towards developing the careers of the individuals that work there with training and education and participation in all of the programs of the Farm Worker Foundation. And I, I would echo that as well at Benesri Vineyards. Um, it's, it's been wonderful to transition up from a mostly migrant workforce to a, a mostly stable workforce has been great because it, there's so much uh, uh, education that can go on in, in building a career development, skill development, um, and, and it really viticulture is a full-time uh, occupation. It, it, it might seem seasonal. You got pr 
pruning and you got harvest, but there's so much more that goes on and we need a skilled workforce year round. And it's interesting, I know Napa County Board of Supervisors is considering a minimum wage increase in the county to go above the $10 an hour that the state will mandate in 2016. And when you think of that in the context of, uh, you know, entry level vineyard work starting at 14, I think that we can all be very proud and there's work left to do. Um, good to hear that all three of your companies are equally invested. And so as we look forward, we're going to close as we look forward to the next few months and to the next season. Uh, I just want to thank you all. And I think that's all of our questions. We will close for now. Enjoy the next few weeks, Matt and Remy, in the cellar. And we'll look forward to <laughs> what you make from this tremendous vintage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.